that together, I forgot that was an outside of it. Can you hear me? Does that work? Okay. Well, um, okay, so hi, I'm Harrison. I'm a PhD student at the uh, university here. My advisor is uh, Greg Tucker, and um, uh, my co author here is Shannon Nahan at the USGS. Um, uh, this is going to be uh, some talk on my dissertation research. And uh, I'd like to thank the USGS and the American Chemical Society for uh, funding this. So uh, to start, I'd like to say I'm, I'm really honored that I get to um, give this talk in front of you guys. I see everyone in this room as sort of this kind of modeler, you know, some really cool guy or gal up on the computer, all the science just blasting out. Um, my, my opinion of myself is more like this when it comes to uh, modeling and computer work, but uh, I'm going to try and show you some of the stuff that I've been doing. Um, so I'm interested in uh, fine sediment transport in rivers. And fine sediment transport is actually really important because it plays a key role in things like landscape evolution um, in terms of modulating how uh, erosion can be promoted or inhibited. Uh, it's really important for our river infrastructure. And, and there's an example right there of a reservoir that's filled in um, and it's not a good reservoir anymore. Um, and, and if we want to answer questions like, well, how do we expect things to our landscapes to change in response to climate change, like it helps to look back at the past and see what uh, conditions were like before we started messing with things. So it lets us sort of compare with, you know, we need more data on this. Um, and this data is actually pretty difficult to obtain, um, partially because, you know, there's a good chance that your sediment has been evacuated from your system, or you need something like some sort of tracer, like a, like a contaminant or so forth, and, and that doesn't always happen. Um, so, um, also rivers are kind of jerks, and so if we uh, know more about them, they're not going to pick on us. So, um, I'm, so if we're talking about fine sediment transport on the long term, uh, one way that it's typically conceptualized is this idealized system between a river channel and its uh, storage center. And uh, in this environment, a grain of sand typically will travel some set distance it'll deposit in a long-term storage center, sit there for years, it'll come up again and be re-eroded and potentially be stored for you know, brief periods of time before going back in these long-term um, storage moments. So I've, I've shown it simply up here, but you know, these, the sort of LS, this characteristic transport length scale, scale and the sort of tau S, this storage time scale, are, are both based on probability distributions of grains moving from place to place. Uh, but if we, you know, if we're very, you know, those, this one thing of sediment transport that I'm interested in is this virtual velocity. If we take the ratio between these two, we can get a rough approximation of a time average velocity of a grain moving through a system. Um, so I want to quantify this, um, but it's, it's very hard to do so. So um, uh, I'm trying to use this method called luminescence, which is kind of interesting and might give us a, a chance to get a quantifying this sediment transport. So luminescence is this really cool property where um, in grains of sand, it will charge up uh, when it's in the dark and it will deplete uh, when it's in sunlight. And the reason it does this um, is because of this property where um, in the crystal lattice of a, of a grain of sand or quartz, for example, there'll be background ionizing radiation, which will displace electrons into uh, defects in a crystal lattice. Um, and now these electrons can only escape these defects if they're given an additional source of energy, which is usually sunlight. Um, this is actually actually a property that's also used for age dating. Um, but here, if we if we conceptualize, if we you know think about our grains moving through the system, they're going to see light in some periods and they're going to be in dark in others. So potentially, we can use this process to infer how things are moving through. Um, sedimentary environment. So to go about doing this, I, oops, I'm so sorry. Um, I went about performing a um, simultaneous conservation of energy and mass um, to develop a model. And, and basically how I constructed it was having our same idealized, um, let's see, what is it? Oh, I'm sorry, everybody, I don't know what I'm doing. So it's conceptualized here as a, um, sort of an idealized river channel and a storage center. And, and what I've done is I've said, okay, if we're gonna look at a handful of sand in the channel, 
there's going to be a flux from un upstream bearing some luminescence. A flux downstream is taking the luminescence out of our location. The luminescence is going to change a little bit due to sunlight exposure, and then there's going to be mixture going on as sediment is either deposited or entrained by the flow. Um, so, and the equation down at the bottom is just sort of a mathematical expression of what I just said. Um, if you take that equation and, and start going further with the math, you end up with something that looks like this. You know, I think a pretty reasonable reaction to this is as such. <laughs> but uh, when you when you clear it up, you find that it simplifies. Oh my gosh, we can we can you know make some assumptions and collapse it down into a form that um, can teach us about what we would expect uh, the luminescence to behave in a system. So we've got five parameters here and two terms. And so the first term, the L, is the luminescence, the sort of bulk luminescence in, of the sand in there. X is downstream distance. That eta term there is a, um, if you put like a handful of sand in the water and it's, it's sort of going downstream, the percent that gets deposited and replaced by re-entrained sediment is that fraction right there. So some percent is being deposited and then rearranged. And uh, the, the LB there is sort of the luminescence that's in the storage center. It's been recharging and it's new stuff coming in. Um, the kappa and beta over there are sort of empirical parameters that describe how the luminescence disappears in sunlight. And then U is sort of a, a velocity in the channel here. And so um, what's useful here, and I, I slightly just rearranged it a little bit um, to show this, but we have five parameters. We can isolate three. The two remaining ones are the ones we care about, which is the exchange rate and the in-channel velocity. And from those, we can calculate um, the length scale, the, the hop, which is green for me. And then from there, we can get our virtual velocity, which we know what the storage time in the reservoir is, which you can get just from uh, using luminescence data. So, um, okay, enough of that. Um, if you're very interested on that horrible page of math, I have a paper and I'm not above shameless plugs. So there you go. Um, but the basic predictions of the model are that, you know, when we're, when we're upstream, uh, we're sort of dominated by luminescence uh, removal. Um, and what we'll end up seeing is that as we go downstream, we should decrease in our luminescence. And when we get to our downstream reaches, that other term, the one that describes the mixing, becomes more important. And eventually we reach a point where they level out and it's a, sort of a balance between the two interacting with each other. So, um, to test this, I, I went to a river, this is the South River in Western Virginia, where uh, that simplified model um, that I showed earlier, the hops and rest kind of approach, was shown to be a, a very good representation of the system. So if we go there and we try our luminescency thing, we can understand if we've you know, found a model that's useful to describe or to try and connect those two. And so uh, what we end up seeing, so the, the predictions here is on the right, or on the left, and then this is my field data on the right. The circles and different colors are two different flavors of luminescence. Uh, some types of luminescence uh, will deplete faster than others, so we can model two separate ones. And um, the solid mines on here are the best fitting model runs um, compared against them. And so uh, what the, uh, to a first order, it seems that we've been able to recreate the shape of the data. Like the model, that model prediction seems to be fulfilled. And if we take the best fitting model runs and compare them with literature values, um, there's generally, uh, there's what I think is a good agreement. Um, so here's the virtual velocity, the sort of rate of exchange with the storage center and that LS, the hop. This is sort of the mean value from the literature and this is the range in brackets here. And uh, these are my luminescence results underneath. And for each of these, it seems like our results kind of fit into these ranges pretty well. Um, especially this one over here, the means, uh, this matches up with the mean pretty well. Um, and then same for the length scale over here, these seem to fit into the ranges uh, that we previously observed in those data. So it's encouraging. I, I interpret that as being uh, really encouraging. Um, the next thing I would like to uh, discuss a model prediction is that if we suddenly started eroding something like a river terrace or, or something old that had really different luminescence, uh, we might expect an increase as the river starts to entrain stuff with more luminescence and mixes it together. Um, so I took this to a place called uh, Linganore Creek in central Maryland. And um, this sort of domain is this channel or this basin is actually kind of interesting because the headwaters are sort of forested. And as you move to the west, they become agricultural. 
and then um, forested again. So, so the yellow is agricultural land cover and the green is forested. And as it done, does so, there's a lithologic control uh, which increases the relief in these forested, uh, forested regions. And so from some hill slope modeling we've done, we expect that these hill slope areas should deliver a, a higher dose of ungroup sediment. And so here's, here's that same thing again. Here's the predictions on the left, and then this is our field data on the right. And so uh, generally, if you look at the range between zero to 20 uh, downstream kilometers, um, I've put in a dashed line there showing in sort of an interpreted relationship. Um, and it, it, it seems to me like it's, it's matching the model prediction fairly well. One complicating factor is that there is a sort of a large reservoir in the middle of it, and we collected samples from downstream, and those, those will break sort of our predicted trend here. So you see that dashed line kind of goes up and stays up, but whereas those samples are way lower. Um, so that could, be, that could be an indication that, you know, A, okay, maybe my model's just wrong. Um, but it also could mean that um, construction of the lake brought in a large amount of bleach material into the, into the channel, or, um, you know, due to the overflow of the lake, that also could expose grains to lots of sunlight and so forth. And then uh, the last test was to go somewhere with uh, high amounts of the human development and uh, land cover to see if um, a strong level of human influence would obscure the natural signal. So um, I mentioned earlier that, you know, I showed you that downstream decline. And that, that is sort of the idealized natural state of a river. And, and what we end up seeing in these really developed areas, or in this particular one, that the luminescence is, is kind of weird. It, it looks like it's approximately constant with distance. I've put in two model runs here to maybe suggest what might be going on, but I don't really believe them. Um, so the possibility is here that, you know, as you, as you develop this environment, you, you dig up sediment, gets onto the surface of the earth, sees lots of sunlight, and then, you know, it gets moved by runoff into the channel and, and caught there. So, you know, it's, it's further supported. So these values right here um, that these data points come in are, are really low compared to everything else in their previous data sets. So I think that generally supports that idea. So um, to conclude, I, I think there's a lot of potential here with this method and, and some of my basic model predictions seem to be supported. Um, in some places where the model assumptions break down, especially in that last case I gave you, it, it sort of limits the application of it. Um, but you know, we can, we can do further work to see if these are reproducible and, and if they're applicable in other rivers throughout the area. So, uh, thank you. Thanks for your time. Thanks, Harrison. Uh, we have time for a question. So, um, this to me, this is really interesting, and I just wonder if you could use the um, the information about where the model doesn't hold if you look at a stratigraphic sequence to begin to identify periods of greater and lesser human impact on the landscape due to agriculture. I actually think you can do that. I think you could go and look at the, you know, you know, geography far downstream of the system and look at how the luminescence rate changes through that. And, and what this model would predict is that you would see change of wind as the rent levels change in the system. So some people have already done that. Um, there's this really cool new invention called a portable OSL reader where you can just go out there and measure the luminescence of these hills. And so people, you know, if you go and look at these figures from GCCC, big jumps where you go from natural sediment to, you know, human sediment or something like that. And I think that would be a really cool change in the luminescence rate if you could do that. Yeah. Oh, okay. Yes. Yes. You said fine sediment, but I think your slide said fine sand. So I'm curious what range of particle sizes are you looking at? But also, it seems like there could be shifts in the particle size moving downstream in large rivers, and how would that influence this um, method? Yeah, absolutely. So I've assumed um, uh, the luminescence that I meant for most of the in the 90 to 250 grain size, which usually travels with the sun's load. And for, for these rivers, um, you know, the, the grain size roughly seems to be very, you know, fairly stable. You're looking at that same fraction as you go. But as you, you know, as your river basin gets larger and larger, those grains will shrink and shrink. 
here in the methane. So what you end up doing with the model is now your subsampling drains um, from when they were last that size to this point. So there, I'm, to answer your question, there could be a, a, a point at which you lose the information from upstream because the drain gets full and you can't use all eight and so forth. Um, but I'm not sure where that point is. So it's, it's kind of tough because you can't really apply the model to drain sizes bigger than that. Um, or, you know, and there's uh, problems with doing it on sampling drain sizes. So it is a good question of whether that drain size is representative of the upstream. data set was observed over a 60 kilometer long loop uh, and the, the next two were over a 20 kilometer long loop. Uh, and so the, the length scales of the sediment hops you would get end up being on the order of kilometers or something like that. Does that answer your question? You can. You, yeah, I didn't, I didn't actually do that one. Can, depending on what you assume for the, you know, the process parameters, I'm assuming you can get a long loop. 